All right, so here we are. We've got the first week in March. So we thought we'd better switch from the football to the basketball since March Madness kicks off here. Um, and of course, this reminds us always of those fundamentals and how we're a church that's focused on those fundamentals because the team that wins this tournament um, this next spring here will be um, the team that is most versed in those fundamentals. And that's why we want to be a church that's versed in the fundamentals too. And so we're going to dive into this final piece that Paul teaches us in this letter, which essentially boils down to this call to arms. But it really is just the fundamentals, and it's actually just putting on Jesus. That's what putting on the armor of God is all about. So after having laid out all it is that Paul did describing the doctrines, all those things that we're supposed to believe in our faith, and then after spending a lot of time in the details of our faith and actually showing us how it is that we're to behave in light of our belief, then Paul essentially gives us our marching orders. And these marching orders, they point us right back again to this middle voice that we just can't seem to avoid because the middle voice is how this born-again life that we lead, how it unfolds. And essentially the middle voice, it recon reconciles our tendency to want to operate at the two extremes that you see up there on that graphic, where on the one hand, we kind of want to do everything as a Christian under our own strength. We just want to be good people. But then on the other hand, we um, sometimes just give up and we just fall into that phrase, let go and let God, and we just let God handle everything. And what Paul is teaching us here is that we don't want to operate at those two extremes. We want to operate in the middle voice. First, he orders us that we're to be strong in the Lord, because this is his battle, and we're only going to be victorious if we fight it by his strength. So we don't fight under our own power, where we try to do absolutely everything. No, we're strong in the Lord. But just to make sure that we don't land on the other side of that spectrum, because we like to bounce back and forth between extremes, he says to us that we're to put on the full armor of God. And that's what brings us right back to that middle voice. So once we grasp where it is that our strength comes from, and once we understand what our role is in this particular battle, then we got something to do. We got to shift into gear, employing every single weapon that God gives us. Because the enemy is a real threat. He's very good at what he does. But that doesn't cause us to fear because we take hope, because we know the victory's already been won by Christ's work on the cross. Okay, so for our text today, Paul starts out yet again. Now, for the fourth time, he reminds us what we're supposed to do once we put on our armor. He says, we stand, therefore. That means we don't sit, we don't attack, we don't retreat, we don't sit there cowering in fear, we stand strong in the Lord and with the whole armor of God on us. And that's because we're engaged in a cosmic battle, one that has eternal implications. So we got to be at the ready, fully alert, vigilant for whatever might come our way each and every day. So we can't believe this lie the devil likes to tell us, that being a Christian is actually a life of ease and luxury. No, it's a battle with cosmic implications. So we're to pull ourselves together and stand, because as we learned last week, that's what this word stand means, to pull yourself together, no matter what comes your way. We do this for two main reasons. First, out of respect for God, because we're in his army now. And second, we stand so that we can look that enemy square in the eye, because he's actually pretty darn good at what he does. He's a formidable foe for us. So we want to be able to stare him down and see what's coming our way. And if we happen to get knocked down, we learned last week, what are we supposed to do? We get right back up again. I don't know about you, but that's one of the reasons I'm glad we shifted from football to basketball. Because these days, when you watch the NFL, they just lay on the ground all the time when they get hit. It drives me crazy. You get right back up. That's what you do. And that's what we're supposed to do. We get right back up on our feet. And we're especially mindful of that after a victory that we've had because we like to celebrate it, become a little complacent, but we learn that we got to get right back up because that enemy is always on the prowl and he's always looking to counterattack. Okay, so now let's unpack this armor. We're going to turn to the very first piece of armor that Paul tells us about, 
the belt of truth. You can see it up there in purple. Now, this is no doubt listed first because the belt of truth is actually that fundamental piece of armor that we have to put on. Now, back in the day, soldiers essentially wore a tunic, which was basically just a sheet. And that belt was used to hold that sheet in place because the sheet basically had a couple of functions. First, it protected soldiers from the elements, from the sun, from the wind, from the cold, from the heat, right? So that's what that thing was there for. But it also protected those soldiers, their dignity. So those are two things we've got to keep in mind, kind of protecting them, you know, so they can do their job, but then also protecting their dignity. Imagine the enemy attacking you, and you don't have your belt on, so you're busy, like, trying to hold this sheet in place and, like, you know, defend yourself. It's hard enough for most of us if we go out to pick up the newspaper in our robe, right? And then the wind picks up because you're like always trying to hold it together and grab your newspaper, right? I'm sure many of us have gone to work and we forgot to wear our belt. And so you spend the whole day kind of yanking up your trousers. And this seems to be a particularly problematic issue for plumbers for some reason. Not quite sure why, what their problem is. I actually had a really good graphic for you guys this morning, but Cammie wouldn't let me put it up. So... But I'll let you use your imagination. I'm sure you can kind of grasp what's going on here. You get the idea. Basically, the belt facilitates freedom of movement for a soldier so they could perform optimally and so they could perform with dignity. So Paul is teaching us that the truth is basically that belt for us. It's the foundational piece of our armor. Think about that for a minute. The truth, the role that truth plays in our life. And I hope by now we all know what we mean by this word truth, because we've talked about it, and Paul's taught us about this really for the last two years. We've seen it all through the letter. It's the person, words, and works of Christ. That is where we find truth. So this is the truth of Jesus. It's not our version of truth, and it's certainly not truth according to us. Truth is not relative. Truth is absolute, and it's only found in the person, words, and works of Christ. So when we've been born again, truth is what gives us the freedom of maneuver. It's what we need to carry on our lives as Christians because it allows us then to operate at our full potential. We've got use of all of our appendages because our belt is around us. And it facilitates us operating with dignity, with respect, and with honor. And if you think about the role of truth now, it's actually pretty remarkable because as Christians, how do we operate if we aren't operating in step with truth? So a spirit-filled life is always marked by truth. So how do we fasten this belt of truth around us? Well, since truth involves this man, Jesus, to know truth means we must know him. So first it means being in a personal relationship with Jesus. And the question I have for us today is, do we have one of those? Are we in a personal relationship with him? Do we spend time with him each and every day growing in our relationship with him? Do we seek to imitate him? That's what Paul told us we need to be doing, right? And how do we imitate him? By walking in love. And why is that? Because Jesus is love. God is love, right? He showed us what love looks like because he sent his son, to leave the glory of heaven, to come down and become fully human, and then his son chose to go to the cross out of love for us so that we might be restored in relationship with our Father. So he fought this battle for us. He's the reason we're victorious, and it's all because of love. That's what makes us victorious, and that's what makes us able to stand firm against all the enemy's attacks. So if we want to imitate him, We must love too. Second, knowing Jesus entails that we know our Bibles inside and out. So, so important that this thing lives with us everywhere we go. Because our Bible, from cover to cover, contains the truth of Jesus. It tells us all about the person of Jesus. It contains his words, and it shows us every single one of his works going all the way back to creation. So if we want to know Jesus, we must know this book. 
It's why we go line by line here at Four Mile. We want to make sure that we're hearing the truth from God that he gave to us from the prophets. I don't want you hearing the truth from me or Cami up here or from Jack or whoever else happens to be up here praying. That's oftentimes kind of twisted by us, even though we don't mean to, but it can be. What we want to do is unpack the truth of Scripture so that you're hearing specifically and directly from God. That's why we don't stand up here and tell jokes or these amusing personal stories or talk politics because we're here to show the truth. And each week we want to unpack it so that we all know it and that we know all of it. We don't want to like just skip the stuff that's kind of hard and the stuff that we don't want to hear about. That's why Cammy reminded you today that we love you enough to tell you the truth, the entire truth, not just the easy, fun, and good stuff, but all of it, because it's what gives us freedom of movement, the ability to operate at our full potential and the ability to operate with dignity in the face of whatever evil might come our way. That's the language Paul uses. So much of the evil that we confront each day actually comes from false prophets. And false prophets are everywhere. We see them all over Scripture. We're reminded of them. And false prophets, they tend to be the kind of people who like to give you their version of truth. Or they happen to distort it to make themselves look a little bit better. In fact, any one of us could be false prophets whenever we take liberties with the truth of Scripture. And that's why we go word by word and line by line, so we don't ever do that. Anytime we do take liberties, we are at risk of that. And so as born-again believers, we want to be so focused on truth. It's what gives us that freedom. It's what gives us that dignity in our lives. So we simply must know our Bibles, inside and out. It's our first line of defense because it contains the truth. In fact, in Paul's second letter to Timothy, he writes, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Do you see the parallels here? Let me just read that again. All Scripture, breathed out by God. It comes from Him. That's why we have to hear from Him. It's profitable for all kinds of things, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God can be complete, so that we can fight these battles. We're equipped for every single good work. You see, if we don't know our Bibles, we are failing to put on the single most critical piece of our armor. And so our tunics will be out there flapping. And that's why so many of us feel that way in our Christian walk. We feel like things are just flapping out there, right? We're not very productive. We're not progressing in holiness. And we also realize that we aren't living this life that we need to live that lack, because it lacks its dignity and the fact that we're not pursuing truth. So here's the thing. When we step back and we unpack every one of these six different pieces of armor of God, what we're going to find is that it all boils down to putting on Jesus. That's basically what this is. And Jesus is the truth. And so Paul is telling us, first and foremost, we must put on the truth of Jesus in our lives. That's what that belt of truth is all about. Next, the second piece of armor. Paul says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, back in Paul's day, a breastplate was typically made of bronze. So that doesn't sound like overly comfortable, does it? Well, as you can see on the graphic up here, um, that, that breastplate basically started up here and it worked its way all the way down the torso, all the way to the upper thighs, as you see in orange up there. So imagine this piece of kind of copper on top of you like that. But it was so important to wear because it covered such an important part of our body where all of our vitals are. So if you think about where does the enemy want to attack, he wants to attack our vitals. He wants to get a kill shot. So he's shooting for our heart. He's shooting for our lungs. He's trying to take out the liver to puncture that intestine or our gut somewhere so he can take us out. In other words, he's aiming at our inner being, where those organs that are associated with our soul, our spirit, and our emotions, where we typically affiliate with where they reside. And that's why this is most likely where the devil strategically focuses his attack, isn't it? He is continually trying to break our spirit to get us all twisted up emotionally by either making us feel that we're not good enough 
to be in God's army or that God is really lucky to have us. He loves to remind us that that exhilarating feeling we experienced, the day in which we were baptized, that it's gone now, isn't it? You don't feel the same way. So therefore, you must have fallen out of grace because you don't feel the same way that you did that day you were baptized. In fact, we see that the devil even attacked Jesus in the very same way. Jesus had been baptized, received the Holy Spirit, was let out into the desert for a period of 40 days or so fasting, and then the devil attacks him, right? And what did Jesus do? He responded with the truth of Scripture to every single one of the devil's temptations. And that's why we must know all about this, because just like that armor provides us protection against those arrows that could be shot at us by the enemy, so too this breastplate of righteousness provides a measure of assurance in the face of the devil's attacks. And once again, we must also be very familiar with this word righteousness. It means acceptable before God. And so just like truth is not ours, it's the truth of Christ, righteousness is not ours either. It's the righteousness of Christ. Remember, all this armor boils, on, boils down to essentially putting on Jesus. And so this takes us back yet again to our wide and narrow path. We visit this all the time. It's so important because it contains the gospel message. Recall that we're, when, when we're on that wide, dark path that leads to eternal destruction, and we repent of our sin and we place our faith in Jesus, we're justified. We're made right by that red drop of Christ's blood up there, which means we're washed clean. We're born again into a new life in Christ. That means we're made right. It means we're acceptable before God. So how does this actually happen in practice? Well, justification essentially implies an imputed righteousness. Don't you like that word? So, so when you go and you're hanging around the water cooler tomorrow at work, and someone says, hey, I was church yesterday. You say, well, we learned about imputed righteousness. Um, you'll sound pretty clever at a minimum, I think, right? So, but you've got to know what it means. So what does that mean? Well, it means when we're justified, the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us. So we take on his righteousness, and he takes on our sin. So we essentially swap places. That's what this means. We now stand before God as though we're Jesus, completely righteous. And Jesus now stands before God, clothed in all our sin. And that's why he had to go to the cross, because God doesn't let sin off the hook. He's a just God. Someone had to pay the penalty for it, and Jesus chose to do that. Also, that his righteousness could be imputed to us. That's what this breastplate is all about. So when the devil tells you that you're not good enough, you tell him, you're right, I'm not. But Jesus is. And I have his righteousness. That's what this breastplate is. Or when the devil tells you that, boy, God is sure lucky to have you, you say, no, he's not. But he has Jesus. And I have his righteousness. So no matter how the devil attacks us, we are prepared because we have that breastplate of Christ's righteousness that we are standing behind. That's what is protecting us. This is actually what gives us the assurance of our salvation. It's not our righteousness, because none of us could ever be good enough. It's Christ's righteousness. And that is the only way that we can stand before God. Think about this for just a minute. We can't even look into the face of God unless Jesus is there and we look into his face first. And God cannot look at us because of our sin and his holiness unless he looks at us through his son Jesus first. So Jesus is absolutely critical to this relationship between us and his Father. And that's because we've been justified. When we've been born again into a new life in Christ, that righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, not by anything we did. Remember, it's by grace, unmerited favor. It's that cosmic power of gentle grace that Christ gives us and grants us. So our assurance of salvation is not based at all in us. It's based solely in Christ alone. And not only is this righteousness imputed, but it's also imparted. Another fancy term you get to use tomorrow. 
Imputed righteousness is all about that justification, and imparted righteousness is all about sanctification. As we've learned, justification and sanctification, they go hand in hand. When you've been justified, you will be sanctified. Of course, sanctification is the work of the Holy Spirit who's inside of us, walking us down that narrow, well-lighted path towards that gate. As the Holy Spirit is always making us more like Jesus. He's always pointing us to him. That's his business. That's what he's about. That's what's meant by this term, imparted righteousness. So essentially, the Holy Spirit imparts righteousness to us each and every day as he's convicting us, as he's counseling us, as he's comforting us. And what is the object of all of that? The truth of Scripture. That's what he's always pointing us to. It's what it means to progress in holiness or righteousness as we move toward that narrow gate. So rather than continue in the sin that marked our lives before, we put off those old clothes and we put on the whole armor of God, meaning we put on Christ. We fasten on that belt of truth in the person, words, and works of Jesus Christ. And we put on that breastplate of Christ's righteousness that makes us acceptable before God so that we can stand firm against the enemy. No matter what he sends our way, whether, no matter what we're going through this very moment today, or what's going to happen to us down the road, we stand firm because we stand in Christ alone. Let's pray. Almighty, loving, merciful, and gracious God, Thank you for being the source of our strength. Thank you for issuing us armor so that we can stand against the attacks of the evil one. Thank you that this armor equips us with the truth and righteousness of Christ. Thank you for justifying us by Christ's blood and sanctifying us by your Holy Spirit as we progress in holiness for your glory alone. It's in the beautiful powerful and wonderful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So for our response time today, we're going to do what we've been doing in our Wednesday Lent services. We've had just tremendous feedback from this. Um, And basically part of it is you come in here, there's like this 20 minute loop, but part of that loop contains a song. And we just invite you to sit quietly and just really focus in on the words of that song. If you know it, feel free to sing along if you'd like. But it's an opportunity for us to really grasp all it is that we're learning from this particular passage. Because the title of the song is, Love is War. And when we think about the war we're in, and we think about the role of love, we're essentially putting on Christ as we put on the armor of God. And this is our opportunity to really appreciate the battle that we're all engaged in.